quick questions. Um, my name is Sylvia and I'm part of the Christian Union here and I'm putting on these events. Um, yeah, there's been these events every day this week and there is um, tomorrow and Friday as well. So, um, hopefully you've had some time to grab food um, and we're going to have a short talk and then a question and answer session. So if you come with questions or maybe pick up questions during the talk, um, text them into the number above my head. Um, if you can see it, can I just see it? Um, yeah, so today we're going to be looking at the big question, how can Christians claim that Jesus is the only way? So with all the religions that are out there in the world, how can Christians stand there and say, no, ours is right? Um, yeah, so to help us explore that, we've got Nathan. So if you'd like to welcome him up. Great, thank you Sylvia, thank you uh, for having me here um, as well. Uh, I hope you've got some lunch and some uh, drink and stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to speak for, for a few minutes and then I'll have some time for Sylvia set for questions uh, at the end as well. But we're thinking about this question, arrogant and intolerant, how can Christians claim that Jesus Christ is the only way? Uh, until quite recently, um, I lived uh, very close to a London Underground station, down in London, and on my morning commute, my morning walk to the station, I walked uh, past a number of interesting places. So first of all, I walked past this dog grooming shop that was right next to where I lived, and the poodle was often in the, the window, sort of hair everywhere, receiving an interesting bone, like that kind of thing. Uh, then I walked uh, a little further, and there was a sort of, I don't know if this happens in Nottingham as much, but there's loads of kind of pretentious coffee shops in London that that serve sort of organic carrot juice and free range eggs on bright bread served on a slate board. People Instagram me every moment of it as they eat their meal. Uh, pretend I don't love those places, actually super really love them. Um, there we go. So those are kind of places, but if I carry on walking, I walk past the, the Holloway Road Mosque, uh, often overflowing at prayer times. Walk past the London Buddhist Centre, with a lot of activity. The light was always on in there till late. At the other side of the road there was the Church of England Church, um, St Mary's Church. If I carried on, I would walk past Waitrose. I don't know if you've got Waitrose, it's near, near here, but oh man, it's, you sort of overhear conversations outside Waitrose of people outraged that they've run out of couscous and quinoa and essential <laughs> avocados. How are they going to survive for the next 24 hours? Uh, but I'd walk past Waitrose, get to the station, start my day. Why, why do I tell you about my one of the as interesting as you might find it. It was because, particularly as I walked past these religious buildings on the way to the tube station, as a follower of Jesus myself, I remember his words in John's Gospel, you've got that there in front of you, in chapter 14, where he says these words. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. A few Recognize those words, maybe remember them from school assembly when you were younger, or something like that, maybe. But what do you make of Jesus' incredibly un PC claim? No one comes to the Father, to God, except through Him. When it comes to religion, Jesus is pretty upfront about claiming to be the only way, the only valid option. What's maybe even more outrageous, you might think, is it's not just Jesus that has said that, but, but billions of Christians ever since have been repeating those words and believing them to be true. To say that Jesus is the only way, that he gives eternal life, that he is the only way that we can know God. After all, that's what's up for crowds. What do you think of that? Like, I don't know how, more, how familiar you are with, with Jesus' words more generally, but in this case, this phrase, does he not need a spin doctor or a PR team to kind of help him get into the 21st century and up to date with what's going on? I grew up in the dark depths of the, the West Country, in Cornwall. There's never got any other. Yes, good. There's one other person from Cornwall that made that. Um, but it's a land of you know, pasties and pixies and pirates and those kind of things. But in Cornwall, I could probably get away with maybe believing those things there. But in London, for me, or Nottingham here, students, lots of people around, friends from, from different religions, from different views on God, how, how rude, or actually how hateful, intolerant, exclusive of me, of members of the Christian Union, to, to hold to Jesus' exclusive truth claims, you might wonder. Is that the kind of mindset that starts wars in the name of religion as well? Because we live in a multi-faith society, 
daily to day, there's no place, you might say, for this kind of attitude. Surely Christians need to wake up and catch up with the rest of society. Many of you will be coming, I'm sure, with that in mind today. And surely that's fair enough. So if you uh, hop on Google, as I did my research for this, I went on Google and typed in uh, how many religions are there in the world. And it came up quickly with the search and uh, showed that there's about 4,200 different religions uh, that were out there. Google, they tell me everything. Maybe there's even more than that. 4,200 plus different religions. Yes, some of those were the, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, or the, uh, the religion of the Invisible Pink Unicorn, uh, or Jediism that's making a bit of a comeback after the Star Wars film recently. But how does Christianity claim to be the way, the only valid option out of the overwhelming 4,200 plus different options out there? Listen, I'm not expecting that you're you're going to come here today, grab a bit of lunch, and suddenly be convinced of all the truth claims of Christianity in 20 minutes. But I want to just prod away perhaps a few assumptions uh, that we might hold when it comes to different religions, issues of tolerance, exclusivity. And then I'll show you briefly why, why I, and members of the Christian Union, would believe Christianity to be unique and actually very appealing in its claims. So we're going to do that. Two assumptions, and then three little things uh, unique about Christianity. So first of all, the assumption all religions are basically the same. I don't know if you've said this or maybe you've, you've heard that before, that all religions are basically the same, right? Um, I came on to Nottingham on Monday and uh, I, I came by train from London. Uh, I got a train up and uh, very nice, uh, not, not first class, but I mean, standing class, but still very good. And I came up and I got into Nottingham Station. But there's other trains that come through Nottingham, I'm sure, from the north and east and west. And those kind of things, they, they, they all come through. Some of the trains might be old, some of them might be new, but they all kind of get to Nottingham, you could say, in the end. So I think mean, people might say are similar with, with religions, that you've got Christianity on one branch coming in here, or you've got Islam on the other, um, Buddhism, Hinduism coming in perhaps in the southeast, coming, but, but they all get to Nottingham in the end. After all, Nottingham is the centre of the universe. <laughs> but they all get to there in the end. People might say that kind of thing with religion. Uh, it sounds lovely, doesn't it? It sounds attractive. You call your God this name, I call him this name, but basically all the same, aren't they? Let me illustrate it in a slightly different way with uh, the story of the, the blind man and the elephant. I don't know if you've, you've seen or heard this story before. But the story goes like this. The six blind men uh, that you can see, that they encounter an elephant. And the first man uh, touches the elephant's trunk. And as he can touch the trunk, he says, oh, elephants are like palm trees. Okay. Uh, the next one goes up to its side and, and feels the side of the elephant and says, oh no, actually elephants are, are like brick walls, concrete brick walls, that's what they're like. And then the, well, the others goes up to the tail, uh, cheeky chappy at the end, they're smiling, pulling the tail at the end and, and saying, no, actually, uh, elephants are like pieces of rope, that's what they're like. So each comes into contact with a different part of the elephant and is convinced that their own explanation is correct and that all the others are wrong. None of them realise that they're experiencing just one part of the same elephant and that none of their explanations are complete. And in the same way as argues, uh, when different religions experience different parts of not the elephant but of God, but they fail to realise that each one is, is just part of the, of the complete picture, of the complete truth. People, well, they like this story. It sounds fair, it sounds humble, doesn't it? The problem though with this interpretation of the story, the best phrase actually is a question. How does the interpreter or the storyteller know that every religion is just a part of the overall conception of God? In order to know this, the, the storyteller, the interpreter, would have to be able to see God in all his fullness and understand how each religion reflects just a part of that complete picture. Do you see what the storyteller is saying? Look, these individual different religions here, whatever it might be, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, they're blind. They don't see the whole thing. But actually, I stand back and I see it all. I see the big picture. Perhaps not quite as humble as it seems, the story at first. Well, I'm sure there'll be many coming along today who would love to think of all religions being in essence the same out of a desire for peace and unity. But let's just take, uh, just take one fairly fundamental question when it comes to religion. 
And the question, who is God? Fairly central, you would have thought, when we talk about religion. Who is God? Well, Christianity would say one God, three persons, Trinity. Islam would say Allah, one God. Buddhism would say no personal gods. Hinduism would say, say 330 million different gods. I could carry on. Even though we might very much like it to be the case, they, they can't all be right. Their, their claims clash, don't they? Actually, it'd be hard for us to find many followers of the, the mainstream religions who would go along with that popular assertion that all religions are basically the same. They'd be happy to say, no, Christianity is very different than Hinduism, or Islam is very different than Buddhism. One writer put it like this, he said, all religions could hardly lead to God if they don't even believe in the same one. They don't believe in the same God. Or a guy called James Fraser. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see the chin, the fantastic chin uh, that James Fraser has. But he's writing in the year 1890. And he says these words There is probably no subject in the world about which opinion differs so much as the nature of religion. And to frame a definition on it which would satisfy everyone must obviously be impossible. Yet there has recently, this is in 1890, there has recently been a determined effort to reduce all religions to the same basic phenomenon. It's remarkably perceptive. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that even though it's obvious that there are so many differences between the religions, we've been so desperate to keep everyone happy that we sort of melt them all down and pretend that they're absolutely the same. Are there similarities between religions? Yeah, often there are. Holy books, prayer, community, those kind of things. But the difference is massive. To think that they're all basically believe in God, be nice to people, and the rest is just details, is pretty naive if you look into the individual religion. And that's potentially quite offensive to the followers of different religions to say that they're all basically the same. Okay, but you might ask the question on that. Um, okay, Nathan, doesn't this, though, doesn't this breed a kind of intolerance? Doesn't this breed intolerance? Look, as a culture, can I suggest that we've misunderstood the meaning of the word tolerance at the moment, I think. If you, you get a decent dictionary, you get to the library or something and pick one up, it would define tolerance as something like this. To put up with, allow to exist, or permit. So to put up with, to allow to exist, or permit. But actually in the last few years, what tolerance has come to instead mean the approving, approving the beliefs and actions of others, rather than permitting them or allowing them. It might sound quite subtle and iniquity, but it's gone from accepting the fact that people have lots of different views, some will clash with yours, to instead mean that you have to agree and affirm and accept these different views. That when we talk about tolerance, the assumption is that we're going to disagree with people, and that's okay. That's okay. Okay, perhaps the religions aren't all exactly the same. Second assumption, though, Christians claim of Jesus being the only way. Isn't it so exclusive? Isn't it so exclusive? Is it? In a way, yes. In a way, it is. The verse that I quoted from Jesus at the beginning is pretty clear that there's an in or out. It's not vague or nominal. But let's be clear that actually each one of us is exclusive in our views about religion. And in different ways, but we're each exclusive. Whatever we, we think about religion, you're not going to agree with everyone else. I think that's fairly obvious. Going back to our, our friendly uh, elephant and the blind man that we had up there. I said, although it seems that the story is humble, do you remember that the story assumes that God is unknowable? That the storyteller claims to see the big picture. And it would be better if everyone dropped their traditional views of religion and accepted their view. So what they're saying is that, is, look, you guys have got it wrong. Actually, I see the whole thing, I've got it right. They're making an exclusive truth claim in that, that actually these people have got it wrong, but they've got it right. That is an exclusive truth claim. Or well, to put it another way, I'm aware that not each of us, uh, not everyone in this room will, will kind of believe in eternal life and those kind of things, or the afterlife. But most, if they did believe in that, they'd probably exclude someone from heaven, if we're going to talk about that. Uh, Gaddafi, uh, Saville, Hitler, are they all going to make it? But if you think, no, to some extent that's being exclusive. Whatever we think about religion, we're all going to make exclusive claims. 
It's no more narrow to claim that one religion is right than to claim that one way to think about all religions is right. But do come back to me if you've got questions on those things in a few moments. But I'd love to briefly just suggest now why I and members of the Christian Union, and actually millions of Christians around the globe, actually believe Jesus' claim to be the only way to know God. But what is it that makes Christianity unique from those Google search 4,199 other religions? What is it that makes Christianity unique? And actually, being unique enough, why should we care? You might be asking. Well, three of the reasons on that. First of all, Christianity is unique in the fact that you can investigate it. You can check out whether the evidence holds up, whether it's actually true. Um, I'm staying at the university here just for a few days um, this week. Uh, imagine that so last night I got a little bit peckish about 11 p.m. or something like that, and I opened the fridge, and there was just cheese in the fridge. Okay, a bit disappointed, but I'm going to eat a bit of cheese anyway. So um, I had some brie and gorgonzola and camembert and cheddar and those kind of things, and I ate it and uh, went to sleep. And about 1 a.m. Um, I had a dream. Uh, in the middle of the night, I had a dream, and, and Winston Churchill turned up in my room, uh, in my dream, and, and he said to me, um, Nathan, you're going to be speaking to quite a few people tomorrow. I want you uh, to start a religion in my name. Let's, let's call them Winstonians, okay? That's what the followers would be called. And they all can uh, smoke a cigar or a pipe or whatever it was. Okay, they're Winstonians. I want you to, to proclaim this message um, tomorrow at lunchtime. So I'm here today, you're here today. And I said to you, uh, okay, uh, this is what Winston Churchill told me. Uh, I want you to all become Winstonians. You'd probably say to me, um, okay, uh, give me some evidence. How do we know that it happened? And I would say, yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> I can't really do that to you today. Or imagine travelling back in, in a time machine and you mean Buddha. Uh, you have a nice cup of tea with Buddha, uh, you chat the world, put the world to rights, chat about a few things. And then you, you ask Buddha, can you prove that your religion is true? Or you meet Muhammad. Uh, he explains how the whole of Islam is revealed to him in, in visions, uh, in the cave, the Quran. And you say to him, can you prove that your religion is true? It's kind of hard to check out for us, isn't it, realistically, today. But actually with four gospel accounts of Jesus' life, you've got one of them on your chairs here, John's Gospel, but with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, those four gospel accounts of Jesus' life, we have available to us, for us today, writings that aren't just ideas or philosophies, but actually they make the claim to be history. For example, Luke's account, written uh, within 30, 40 years of Jesus' life on earth. Luke was a, was a doctor and a historian. And it's not a huge gap, 30 or 40 years, that we can see exactly <coughs> what was said. Not something that was written a million miles away, or written many, many years after, but something that was written so close to the time that Jesus was on earth. We see eyewitness accounts. I wonder if you, I think on your chair, if you've got one of those little slips there of Luke's Gospel, uh, I should say Luke 1, 1 to 4, and a little slip. Um, if you don't have it, I think it's going to come on the screen as well. Great, so this is Luke's Gospel, uh, one of the New Testament um, writers, Luke. And uh, in his first chapter, so his introduction, uh, he starts like this. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an account, an orderly account, sorry, for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So Luke, this doctor, this historian, is writing to this bloke Theophilus, and he wants to write to him an orderly account, so that Theophilus and us, as well today, can know the certainty of the claims of Jesus Christ. So if you've ever had a look through, Luke or John, that's also on your chairs. But actually in it you see events, you see place names, people's names, even the types of trees that grew in the area at the time. The Gospel writers were making the claim to be writing history. Maybe you're made from the Christian Union or, or someone you know from the, uh, who's a Christian invited you along today and they bang on, bang on about the Bible, maybe too. <laughs> it's just kind of why, it's because it claims that we can know truth 
about God. That's why Christians are excited to see Jesus in the Bible. So can I challenge you, if you never have read one of these before, do take it away as a gift from the, the Christian Union. And maybe as you're just flicking through it and reading John's Gospel, ask the question, as you read it, does this stack up? Is this true? Is there good evidence that this took place as it said it did? We can investigate it. It's unique in that sense. It's unique as well in the fact that God has visited this earth. Christian God has visited this earth. But there's just an outrageous claim for, for members of, maybe of other religions that are here. That rather than being uh, distant and aloof and unknowable, the claim of Christianity is that God has actually entered into our worlds as the person of Jesus Christ. Some Christians celebrate it at Christmas. That he made himself known as a baby boy, learning to do all the things that, that babies do. Of, well, they don't really learn, do they just sleep, poo, and, and eat? Those kind of things. I've got a little nephew at the moment, he's going through that stage. That's just good about being an uncle, actually. You don't have to be there all the time. Just come, come for a quick visit and then you can go when the nappy seems to be changed. Those kind of things. But Jesus entered into our world in that fragile form. But rather than it just being a state visit, the boy Jesus, we became a man teaching, healing, and suffering death on a Roman cross. The moment he would say was the point of him coming to this earth all along. Dying on a cross for the humans that he created, for people who want forgiveness for the life that they have lived. If you want to know God, you want to have eternal life. See, the Christian God has not left us in the dark. He's got stuck into the world. That is the claim. And that is unique from other religions. But finally, Christianity is unique in how we obtain relationship with this God who made the universe. Look, I'm not sure um, uh, if, if the official teaching of the the church was flying spaghetti monster. I don't know what the official teaching of the church is. But behind kind of all the world religions and different worldviews is essentially spiritual effort or achievement. If I do this, then God will accept me. If my rights outdo my wrongs, then God will welcome me to eternal life. It's religion. It's described in some sense as rituals, as rules, as regulations. A list of things that we need to do to work our way up towards God, to achieve eternal life. Now, I don't know if you knew this coming along today, but Christianity, Christianity could not be further from this religi religiosity. It shatters the stereotype. Christianity, unique from those other 4,000, uh, how did I say, 4,199 different religions, the uniqueness about Christianity is this word grace. It's a girl's name. It's that it's an absolutely unique characteristic, distinct from any other religion in the world. See, what grace means is that, that rather than us kind of needing to say a certain amount of prayers a day, or, or for our rights to outdo our wrongs, or even for us to get enough church attendances ticked off to merit our way to God, instead of that, the Bible claims that, that rather than us climbing the mountain to get closer to God, instead God has extended his hand to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Broken relationship with God can be restored. That is the claim. Jesus lives the life we can. That's why actually Christians, well they love Jesus as saying, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christians love that, because it says Jesus does what we can. See, God is interested in you someone. God is interested in you personally. This message is unique from other religions. You might have many questions, but I'll have a chance to think of three days in a sec. Does that sound intolerant or exclusive? Well, actually, the claim of the Bible is that it's open to anyone. It's open to absolutely anyone. That's why the Bible calls this message good news. Look, I realise we've raised through a lot of stuff uh, thinking about this question today, but if there has been something that you've been kind of attracted by, or you think, oh, no, I need to check this out, I need to look into this more thoroughly, do take away this. John's Gospel, as I said, have a read through it, see what you make of it. I think it's details that Sylvia will be talking about in a minute, of how you can look into these things more. But reading one of these Gospel accounts, these uncovered John uh, Gospels, will help to reveal what God is like, not just theory about him, but a relationship with the one who made him. That is what is up for grabs after all. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, Sylvia's going to come back now, and then we'll have a chance to...